It's the morning of February 29, 1960 in Florence, South Carolina. 16-year-old Alston Purvis is being driven home from school by family friends. He knows that something is terribly wrong. And soon he will learn that his father is dead. On the upper floor of the family house in the hallway outside his bedroom, Melvin Purvis, the most famous G-man of the 1930s, lies in a pool of his own blood, killed by a 45 caliber bullet fired through his jaw. During the late 1920s and early 1930s, prohibition drove the sale of liquor underground. Violent gangsters rose to power and captured the imagination of the American public. Weak federal laws seemed helpless against these superstar public enemies. The best known mobster, Al Capone of Chicago, was a major celebrity who flaunted his wealth and power. The stock market crash of October 1929 threw the country into the Great Depression. As ordinary people stood in bread lines, gangsters robbed banks and kidnapped the wealthy. The abduction and murder of Charles Lindbergh's baby boy created an outcry verging on hysteria. The public demanded more effective law enforcement. On June 17, 1932, Congress passed the Lindbergh Law, making kidnapping across state lines a federal felony. In November of that year, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president, promising a new deal and a federal war on crime, led by the Bureau of Investigation. The time had come for the feds to go after organized crime, and for two very different young men, J. Edgar Hoover and Melvin Purvis, to take center stage. Melvin Purvis was born in 1903, the first son of a large family from Timmonsville, a small town in the heart of South Carolina tobacco country. He had six sisters and one brother. Melvin Purpose's extraordinary destiny wasn't apparent right away. He studied law at the University of South Carolina in Columbia without much enthusiasm. I had every intention of becoming a businessman. Somewhat to my own surprise, I found myself graduating in law five years later. After earning his law degree in 1925, Purvis took a job with the firm of Wilcox and Hardy in Florence, founded by well-known lawyer P.A. Wilcox. By all accounts, Purvis was smitten with the boss's daughter, Roseanne Wilcox. Oh, he was not a real great catch back then. I mean, he was, was in, in um, a law firm of uh, AA. He was not even a partner. He was uh, more of a, 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 like an intern with, with almost no salary at all. Roseanne married another man and Melvin Purvis began looking for work that would take him away from Florence and, he hoped, provide some adventure. On New Year's Day 1927, Melvin Purvis boarded a train for Washington to apply for a job with the Foreign Service. He was 23 and full of brash self-confidence. But the Foreign Service, it turned out, was not for him. He was told on, on, in, in no uncertain terms there were no vacancies and none were expected in the future and so goodbye. So he went back home thinking, well, I'm back to the old dusty law books again. A close friend of Melvin's father steered him to the Department of Justice, which had just been taken over by a young man named J. Edgar Hoover. He had a lot of letters of recommendation from Senator Smith in South Carolina and things like that. So, um, and Hoover, you take the thing very seriously. And so he applied, and even though he was underage, underweight, under height, under everything, he, oh, he was accepted. Melvin Purvis was on his way to becoming a federal agent. No sooner was Agent Purvis sworn in than he was sent to Dallas on his first assignment. It was a cold case, a car stolen in Denver, Colorado. As Purvis flipped through the file, he noticed the address of a restaurant in Dallas that the suspect might have visited. 
The owner of the restaurant denied knowing the man, but pointed Purvis to some numbers on the wall near the telephone. Sure enough, one of the numbers led him to the suspect, and Purvis called the Dallas police to come and arrest him. Catching this criminal was luck, beginner's luck, Purvis said. He had cracked his first case.